Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over the brand new Concorde by DC Designs for Microsoft Flight Simulator. So for all those who may be hesitant on whether you may want to purchase this or not, we're going to go over all the pros and cons of this aircraft. So is it worth it? Isn't it worth it? All coming up next on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers. So before we get into the review of the new Concorde, be sure to go down below and hit that subscribe button and tick that little bell and smash on that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. So I thought we would first go over the exterior of the model and check out some of the pros and cons and let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments section. So right off the bat, I think everybody can see all of these little ripples and little undulations here in the fuselage or the snoot of this aircraft. So let's take a look here at where the snoot divides from the rest of the aircraft. And if we take a look here, it almost looks a little cartoonish to me. So let's take a look uh, underneath of the fuselage of the aircraft. And we can also see again here where the snoot divides. Now if we get a little bit closer here, you can see those jagged edges that I was talking to you about. And the separation just doesn't look all that great. So if you have purchased this, leave your comments down below. Let me know what your thoughts are of the aircraft. So let's pan over here to the front landing gear and let's take a look at the detail that are in these. Now for the landing gear on the Concorde, I think this looks pretty nice. The detail that's put into the front landing gear looks pretty good. But see, if we pan up and then we take a look at this panel here, or vent or whatever it's supposed to be, it really does not look that good. So let's take a look at the rear landing gear and see what these look like. Now the other things that I noticed here with the landing gear are, or with the Concorde, we have these little brackets that come down in front of the wheels. Now somebody can correct me down below in the comments and let me know what these are actually called, but I believe that they're pretty much your parking brake chocks. Now if we get a little bit closer on the wheels, everything looks okay, but as you can see the detail on the rims of these wheels don't look all that great. In any case, one thing I can say with these parking brake chocks is that when you do release the parking brakes inside the aircraft, they remain in place. So if you are a Concorde pilot or know about the Concorde, let me know, are these supposed to stay there? So or now let's move a little bit further after the aircraft and take a look at these engines. From the outside, they look pretty nicely designed. They look pretty nicely modeled. You can see little Rolls-Royce emblem on the side here. Again, you can see the texturing just doesn't look all that great on it. Now keep in mind, this product is $39.99 from the Just Flight website or the Just Flight store. Links will be down below in the description. Now panning around to the aft of the engines, let's move in here and take a look at the inside. As again, we can see that the inside of these engines really don't look modeled that well. Let me know your comments down below of what your thoughts are of the Concorde. While we're at the back of the aircraft, let's take a look at the rear landing gear and the modeling done here. Now here you can really, really see the facets in this wheel and the tail landing gear just doesn't look that great i just don't think the effort was put into the modeling on that and again if you get into the light you can see these ripples and jagged edges all the way down the fuselage now some people may not care about the external modeling or how the plane looks on the outside but maybe a lot of people really care about what this plane's going to look like on the inside and maybe more importantly, how is it actually going to fly? Again, if we take a look here as I'm panning around, you can see all of these jagged edges along the wing line. I just, it just doesn't do it for me. All right, so let's hop on the inside and take a look at the cabin area and the cockpit. Presto, we are now on the inside looking at what you as a passenger would see looking out the windows. Again, we have that real common jagged edge facets all over everything 
it just really doesn't look that good in my opinion but they did say that they didn't put a ton of effort into the cabin of the aircraft that they were trying to put more effort into the cockpit so let's move forward here and take a look and see what might be in the galley area so as we're moving up here through the galley area if we try to click on anything I've seen pictures with these doors open and I have no idea how these are supposed to open so if you are aware of how to open those doors leave me a comment down below and let me know on that I don't think any of these open either although it is nice to see that they have included a really nice galley area and as you can see it looks kind of like 2d ish to me now the other cool thing is that when you do call for the jetway these doors will open for you but I don't think there's any way to open these manually now if we take a look at the top of the door here you can see all those little facets again so I think I'm gonna stop talking about those facets and you're just gonna know that you're gonna see that sprawled out throughout the aircraft and I just got to keep in my head that this aircraft does cost $39.99 so $40 now it's not PMDG money but it is pretty expensive for somebody to drop 40 bucks on this model. Now the first impressions of the flight deck here look pretty nice. When you first come into the flight deck area, it looks okay. So I have played this on both VR and on monitor, and I will say that in VR, it is much easier to play this only because it's easier to read some of these gauges. The problem is that when you're flying this on monitor, you really have to zoom in here to see some of these gauges. Some of the other things that I did notice here on the panel here is that all the switches that you see for the cold and dark are already in the on position. That is not lifelike for a cold and dark situation. They should all be in the off position. All of them, they should all be turned off. So now if we move over here to the left hand side, all of these look pretty good. They're all in the off position. Fuel heaters, they should be in the off position. Now there's a reason why I'm doing all this and that's because we're gonna go through the checklist on this aircraft and we're gonna show you how you may be a little bit confused if you are new to the Concorde as was I and you start running through the checklist and find things are not adding up quite right. So we're gonna go through that here in a second as well. So we take a look over here on the fuel pumps. Again, all of these should be in the off position. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn all these off right now. Now there are a couple things not modeled on this plane, like the oxygen uh, would probably be right down in this area. Now, and all of the switches that are over here do not function. Nothing works over here on the right hand side of the engineers. So over here on the left-hand side of the engineer's left leg, uh, there's a couple things that aren't working here as well. So these are the navigational IRSs, so to speak. Uh, there should be three of them, and we only have two. So if we look over here, we have a passenger button. So for those of you that want to see the passengers in the back, you have to make sure that you click on the passenger button. So let's hop back here and just see if that has added passengers for us. And yes, it has. So now we have passengers here in the back of the aircraft. So if you're wondering why aren't there any passengers, that's how you do it. Now, the other thing that I noticed, these chairs here do not slide forward and backwards. So you can't really position them. So if we go to the engineer's viewpoint and that's control zero. So as you can see, it, it's not really all that great. And you've got a chair here. It would be really cool if this chair could be moved backwards because on monitor, it is really difficult to try to do anything from this viewpoint because you can't see any of the gauges or you really can't see some of the switches. So if we take a look at the gauges that are on here, in my opinion, they don't look that great. Uh, the X-Plane version of the Concorde, in my opinion, looks much, much better. And I do have to give a shout out to my fellow simmer Maverick because without his Concorde tutorials in the X-Plane, I would be lost on this plane because 
the checklist leave a little bit to be desired. Now, I will say that one of the cool things that they've added down here, and a lot of people probably may not even notice that this is here, is this little pad of paper here that they've got, and this is really gonna help your descent. It's gonna explain the rule of 60 to you. I'm not gonna get into any of that right now. This is not a technical tutorial, but I just wanted to point that out, and I thought that that was a really cool thing that they've added. Over here on the right, we've got a little map here, and above that, this is another cool thing that they've added, just some tidbits of information if you weren't sure. Let's show you the vantage point that you get from your normal pilot's position. This is your view, and in my opinion, it makes it again difficult to read all of the switches. So if you look at your overhead panel, it's very difficult to read any of this, and if we try to pan down, I can, I can make out the airspeed in knots here, but all this other stuff is kind of really difficult to make out with your eyes unless you zoom way in. You know, if you put your pilot's position right here, then that's a little bit better. So while we're on the viewpoint topic, let's scroll through all the different added pilot viewpoints here using the control and number function. So if we hit control and one, that's gonna give us that view. Control and two. Control three, control four, control five. This is gonna give you your best view of your little GPS unit here. FMC, if you wanna call it, because unfortunately in this aircraft, they were not able to give us the proper INS that the Concorde had come with. And INS stands for Inertial Navigation System. And that's because there are some issues with gauges or the WAMAS. They explain that in the documentation and literature, but I just want everybody to know that as well. So if you're coming from X-Plane and you want to come over to Microsoft Flight Simulator, hoping that you were going to get that INS experience, well, you are not going to get that here on the Concorde. Position number six, position number seven, position number eight. So let's go to position number nine. Now here it gives us a little bit better positioning to see the switches up top. Now the other thing I want people to notice are of these switches here, that they are set in the blue position already. Now I'm telling you this because you may notice something that's gonna happen once we get into the engine start procedure. The other thing we can take notice of are the fuel shutoff switches. Right now they were all in the off position. Now sometimes I've noticed that when I go to do the start procedure, for some reason, these will turn to normal automatically. These will all turn on automatically. These are already on automatically and these should not be on. So we're gonna turn those off. Those are the throttle masters. The other thing I will say that is really gonna help you that if you turn on the tool tips in the menu. So if you hit escape and go to general options and head over here to accessibility, you really wanna make sure that you're on legacy mode because there's a couple things that you can do while you're on legacy mode that you cannot do in lock mode. And you wanna turn on the instrument name tooltips. This is a way for you to know if the engine rating is either in takeoff mode or in flight mode. But again, here's one of the nuances here. If I go and flick this down, look at that. It's flicking it right back up. I'm not doing that. Why is that happening? So that's another thing that you're gonna notice with this is that there's gonna be switches that you're gonna to wanna to turn on or turn off and you're not gonna be able to. So this panel right in here is the main panel that we're gonna be using to adjust our fuel either forward, aft, or just turn it off. So to do that, and this is going to auto trim your tanks for you, you're gonna open this up and then you can flick this either to back and as you see, some of these pump switches have just turned on, or we can turn this to forward. Again, you can see those switches turn back off. So in talking about fuel trim, the other thing that you really need to make sure is done properly, if you go up here to your fuel and trim menu, that you need to make sure that you have sufficient enough fuel in your trim transfer tanks. If you don't have enough fuel in the trim transfer tanks, then when you try to trim this either forward or backwards the center of gravity is not going to move in the correct manner again i just want to get some close-ups here of everything so you can see 
the amount of detail that may or may not have been put into this. Now the other thing that I wanted to go over with you is your pitch trim wheel that's right over here. Now I was having the darndest of time trying to find where the actual pitch trim positioning gauge was. So from this view, from your pilot's view, if you didn't know that that gauge was right there, you'd never see it. So that's the other thing that I found troublesome is that I, well, I didn't really know where that was and it probably shows in the documentation, but I just probably overlooked that part. And I did read through the entire 108 pages or 106 pages that the documentation has. The next thing that uh, they're going to talk about are some of your gauges up here on the pilot display. Now, one in particular that I wanted to go over with you is the vertical speed over here on the right. And if we take a look at the autopilot panel, we have a vertical speed hold button. Again, some of these tool tips can be very helpful because you may or may not know if something is on or off. You'll see this hold vertical speed, but the other thing, one thing you are gonna notice or not notice is that there is no way to adjust your vertical speed in Concord. So one thing they did tell me down here on this pedestal area here, right over here to the left of your throttles, we have increase or decrease airspeed. We also have the autopilot for your turning left or right, banking. And here is where we can adjust the vertical speed. So you can adjust vertical speed up or down. The other thing is, again, with these menu tooltips, Without the tooltips, you would not know that the left side selector is going to be adjusting your airspeed. And we take a look down here at the trim. If I do move that trim wheel, you can see the gauge over here on the right moving. That's gonna be how to assess the positioning of your trim wheel. So the next thing that I wanted to take a look at are all of the switches up under here. In my opinion, these should all be turned off. So in a cold, dark state, you would not have all of these switches on. They would all be turned off. So I just feel that, you know, if you really want to have that layer of realism, that all of these should be turned off. And the, the other thing is, without these tool tips, it's really hard to differentiate. Just for instance, the, the windshield de-ice, you would never know that the center is off unless you have the tool tips on because when these are on, now you can see that up would be normal, middle is off, and down is high. Again, I think there should be some sort of something here to say, hey, center is off, and at least the center is off, and then maybe high and low, or norm and high, something like that, just to let us know. So you can't even turn these switches on by clicking on them or scrolling over them. You've gotta turn on the windshield de-ice for you to be able to activate any of the visor, the ice, or the de-mist. But as soon as you turn off, see how weird that is? So I think that is a problem with this. And again, if I see how they all come on, if I go across these and click on these, you don't see anything here, but if I turn that back on, look, they're all off. So I think there's some coding issues still here and um, well, we'll get into some other things here in a moment. The other thing that I really didn't like was the armrests here don't really flip up. Now you may say, well, that how's that a deal breaker? But let me tell you, when you're sitting here in the cockpit and you try to look down, it's hard to see any of this stuff over here. So all of the ADF does function back here. None of this works except for system one or two. This doesn't work, and then here is your frequency knobs here, and so all of this works as you would expect. So for anyone interested in the parking brake, this would be your parking brake handle, and then we have a couple switches over here. Again, because there's nothing on here, other than, I think, a little standby, it's really tough to know what this is for, so we hover over that. This is your visor maintenance on and visor maintenance off. Now, this little button over here is for your rain repel. It does have some text here below it that says rain repel, but it's so small that you see how far I've got to zoom in on my screen. All right, so now that we've got into the cockpit a little bit, I've showed you around. You've gotten a look at all the switches, and keep in mind all the positioning of those switches that we have turned them in. And that's going to be pretty important because let's see if 
they move around on us when we go to do our startup procedure. So let's take a look at the checklists that come with Concord. And to do that, all we need to do is go up here to the toolbar and we're gonna head over to the little checkbox. If you do not have that checkbox up here at the top, you can come over here to the custom toolbar, scroll down and go down to where it says checklist and tick that on. Now, I am gonna tell you that I haven't gotten through all of these checklists only because of some of the issues that I was encountering during flight. And again, I have not used the INS system or GPS or FMC or FMS, whatever you wanna call it on the Concorde. And I have looked at it a little bit. It looks a little bit confusing, but we may get into that in a future episode. If you would like to see a future episode on the Concorde INS in Microsoft Flight Simulator, pop a link down below in the comments section and let me know. While you're down there, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button. All right, so opening up the before start checklist. Here's where things can take a little turn if you are new to flying the Concorde. Let's go through this one by one and we'll check it out. So the parking brake is on. I know that here's the parking brake. If you want to see a visual of where the item is, and actually I'm going to do this on purpose and you're going to see why here in a second. So that's going to highlight that little brake. Perfect. That's on. Next, we're going to go up to the blue inverters. Again, we're going to come up to the top side here and all of these, are going to be turned on so for the startup procedure i've turned on the information for which each of these are so just so you get an idea of what's going on here all right so then we're going to go and flip the green inverter on next we have the anti-stall system which are all the way over here so we can flip those on Again, you can see why these really should be in the off position to start with. So the next thing, we would probably have the rudder. You would want to turn that up to your blue channel. Also the outer and middle elevation selector channel. You want to turn that up to blue as well. Again, those are not here on the checklist, but things I thought you should know about. Now we get to the part where it's going to confuse some people. We need to set our Q&H altimeters. So if we click on the little eyeball here and we go down to the altimeter, oh, okay, well, let's try to set the altimeter when we don't have any power to know what the altimeter setting is. Hmm, okay, so I think that's a problem. Oh, well, how about let's go set our nav radios. Let's try that out. Well, we can come over here to the nav radio and I don't care how much you try to turn these because we don't have any power, the nav radio won't turn. So as you can see, there are some nuances here for the checklist that make it a little bit difficult to follow it properly. In my opinion, what you need to do on the before start checklist, go all the way down until you get to the anti-stall system and then switch over to the engine start checklist and go all the way down till you get to the cross feeds, then go back to the before start and finish the remainder of the checklist. Because that's the only way you're gonna be able to set your Q&H, your nav radios, your transponder. You can't do any of that without any power. So let's go ahead and do that and practice what I preach. So let's go over to the engine start procedure and let's go to the ground service switch. So the ground service switch is gonna be right here and that's gonna turn on our external power. And now we're gonna turn on the ESP switch and these are the main batteries. So we're just gonna go ahead and flick that one on and that one on. And now you can hear all the different systems start to fire up in the aircraft. And then we have the EPU. So the EPU might be a little difficult to find because it's hidden by this little selector thing. And keep in mind, we are turning this on right now. I have found, there it goes. Did you just see that everyone? I'm trying to turn it on and it's flipping itself back off again. Even if I try to cover it, it flips itself back off. I don't understand what's going on with this, but it's kind of crazy. The other thing that you would want to do is turn on the SSB so now that we have some ground power going, we're gonna go back to the before start checklist and just continue on. Now, if we go back up to the Q&H and we zoom in down here, now you can see that we have some information 
that we can set the proper Q and H. Let's go over to the nav radios. If we head up to the nav radio now, now you can see that we can set your nav radio frequency. Now, the neat thing about this radio is it's got a swappable frequency, but you can't actually see what the frequency is unless you hit the button here to swap it over. So you want to set all these frequencies up beforehand. And then while you're up in the air, all you need to do is hit it knowing that you have the proper frequency there set up for you. So you probably are going to want to utilize the NAV2 radio because of that. And you may want to set a standby frequency over here as well. Okay, so now if we go to the transponder again, we can see now that the transponder is lit up and we can enter a squawk code. You can also hit the clear button. We'll clear everything. Okay, so now we can check out the ground hydraulics check. So we're going to hit the little eyeball on that one. And this little thing up here, we want to flip this to the yellow position. Before I do that, I just want to check up here. Look at this. So again, all of these switches, remember, I didn't turn these. These turned on themselves automatically, and they all switched to normal. And I think in the real aircraft, that would not happen. Okay, so let's go back over here again. And we're going to flip this up to yellow. And we also want to make sure that the switches over here are in the off position, both left and right. Next, we're going to go over to the fuel heaters. We're going to hit the little eyeball on that. And we're going to come down here and make sure that these are in the auto position. Okay, so next we're going to go to the recirculating valves, and these are already in the shut position, so that's great. Keep in mind that you do need to turn all of these off and make sure they're all off. Again, I think they should have lit up each of these switches so you knew which ones to turn off. Secondary air doors are going to be in auto. Again, you're going to make sure that all of those switches are in the auto, not just that left one. The FMC or the INS... Again, on the normal Concorde, we would come down here and we would have to turn this on standby, this on standby, and there'd be one more that we would have to turn on standby. And then you could adjust this dial here. But in this simulation, you don't really have to do that because I don't really think that does anything. If anybody knows any difference, please let me know down below in the comments section. And of course, this auto button here, I'm not sure what that does either. Let me know on that one as well. We're going to turn the seatbelt switch on. Next, we're going to check for aircraft fuel and weight. Beacon light's going to come on. And again, the beacon light was already on. So I didn't even have to turn that on, which, again, I think it should have been off. Throttles, we're going to make sure throttles are at idle. And we're also going to get into another thing in regards to the throttles and these reheat switches. Actually, I want to talk about that right now before I forget. So one of the things, if you are using an external throttle for your flight sim, when you go full throttle on your throttles, it is automatically going to activate reheat on the Concorde. That is not how this is supposed to work. These reheat switches are supposed to be used so that you can activate the afterburners or the reheat function. I'm going to show you something real quick. I've got my throttles all the way forward on my Bravo throttle quadrant. I'm going to turn on these reheat switches. Now watch these throttles very closely as I turn off the reheat switch. I hope you can pick that up on your monitor, but all of these throttles backed off just a bit. So that's a tip for everybody so that if you are having an issue where you're always on reheat and you want to turn it off, then all you need to do is back off the throttle just a hair to allow the reheat to deactivate, so to speak. If you are a simmer that's using spad.next, it makes it a little bit easier for you because you're able to set the maximum or full throttle for the Bravo. So all you have to do is back off I think the maximum would be, what, 16,383, and you can probably back it off to 1,670 or something. And then when you activate the reheat switch, 
as you can see, it pushes those throttles forward just a little bit. So that's just a little tip for somebody that's using SPAD.next. And um, unfortunately, if you are using the Microsoft Flight Sim uh, way of binding all of your devices, then you are not going to be able to do what I just said. Now, I'm sorry if people are getting a little bit annoyed here of the on-screen uh, display or the on-screen um, identification thing here, but it's going to be really important once we get to the next portion of this. Okay, so now they want us to turn the engine feed pumps on. So let's go back here and we're going to turn on the engine feed pumps. Again, in my opinion, all of these should be lit up in blue because they are all the engine feed pumps. Just going to go across and turn all of these feed pumps on real quick. So the gauges that are above these pumps here, if you're unsure what these are for, this is just going to show you how much fuel is in those tanks. That's why it's really important for fuel to be in your front trim tanks because that is where you're going to be trimming fuel from, from the front to the rear of the aircraft. The one thing that you'll notice here, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll see how this is highlighted in white, or it's got a little outline along this in white. So that, to me, tells me that we're always going to be transferring fuel from these tanks to these tanks and from these tanks back up to these tanks and everything over here and over here are separated. So if I'm wrong, please correct me down below, but I think that is the basic gist of it. All right, so now that we got the engine feed pumps on, we can now start the engine start checklist. So we've already come down to the EPU switch. We've selected that one, but unfortunately, let's go over here again and see it'll stay on now now for some reason the EPU switch is now staying on again I have no idea what caused it to turn off but if you are starting your engines I've had this happen to me if you're starting your engines and this EPU switch turns off then you will not be able to start the next engine in sequence so if for some reason it doesn't spool up Come back here and check this little EPU switch and make sure it's on and you can flick the cover up. But as you saw before, that cover doesn't do anything for keeping it in position. All right, so if we come up here to the top of the engineer's station, we have the air bleed control. So we're gonna turn all of these air bleed switches on. The other thing that we're gonna do is we are going to turn on all the cross feeds. That's something that is not in the checklist here for you to do that, but that should be done. Next, we're gonna go down here to the LP bleed valves and we're gonna make sure that all of those are on. For those of you who are looking for these LP bleed valves in the Concorde, you may have some issues when you're trying to find them. Now, one of the reasons are because they're behind these little red caps here or safety cap so you want to flick these down and now you can see that it's lit up in blue you're gonna to need to turn all of these in the on position so we're just gonna come through turn them all on and then we can close the caps again or leave them open it's up to you next while we're down here we can turn on all four cross feeds which are right here we're gonna pop those on and move on to the engine start procedure for number three so according to the starting procedure, they want you to flip the engine three start, which is right here. So we're gonna go ahead and do that right now and let's minimize that. And when you do that, you're gonna wanna come all the way up here to the front and you're gonna take a look at your N2. And once we get to about 20% of N2, what you would normally wanna do is to look up top side here and flick your fuel control valve to open. But as you just saw, they were all in the open position already. So at some part along the way, the plane automatically flipped these into the open position and that should not be that way. Again, it doesn't say anything about this in our starting checklist. It just says start engine three on 
and then check power levels. That's it. So we're going to come up here and turn on the engine 3 once we got to 20, and it's going to fire up. All right, so I think that is completely spooled up. And according to the sound that I'm hearing from this, it doesn't, it just doesn't sound completely accurate. If you feel the same way, leave me a comment down below what your feelings are on that. <laughs> so I got a little ahead of myself when I started engine number three. There's a couple other things that we need to do um, first on Concord's checklist. Unfortunately, they did not put that in here so on the overhead panel we need to make sure that the drain mast heaters are on and we also need to make sure that the throttle master selectors are in the on position all right so now let's hop over to the engineer panel and do a couple things that we need to do now for the startup for engine number three so we need to come up to the air bleed section and we need to turn on the air con valve for engine number three and we need to come over here and turn on some hydraulics for engine number three again if you have the tool tips up here you can see which ones that is so you can flip on the engine number three and if we take a look at the gauges nothing happens on any of the gauges all right so let's hop down here to the generator or the main bus for number three and we're going to turn on main bus for number three again we have nothing on the gauges so now that we have that done we can come back over here to the air bleed control and we're going to switch off bleed control for engine number three and the cross bleed we're going to turn that off for engine number three as well none of this is in the checklist for this aircraft here because these are all already on the in the on position and again, I think that really takes away from the realism of the aircraft. So now what we need to do is just do a little rinse and repeat here for the remainder of the engines. So what we're going to do is start up engine number two next. So we're just going to come down here to engine number two. We're going to hit that starter to the on position. And we're just going to come and take a look at the gauge here. And once we get up to about 20% on the N2, we are going to activate the fuel. Now we are at 20%. We can come up and activate the fuel for engine number two. It sure is a pretty plane, though. I've got to say that. It is such a beautiful plane. Okay, so at this point, we, have, we should have enough hydraulic pressure to lower the snoot on the nose a little bit, and usually we would drop down to five degrees Unfortunately, they don't model the hydraulic pressure properly because as soon as you turn the batteries on, you're able to drop the snoot. As you can see, it says flap lever. So if you're gonna bind a control to it, all you need to do is bind your flap lever and lower that snoot. Now, if you noticed when I did lower this, do you see the light change in the background for the snoot? I have no idea why that is but just something else to keep in mind. It does take a couple seconds for the snoot to start to activate and drop down for us. At this point, we would then want to call the pushback and get ready for our pushback. So while they're getting ready, we can go ahead and finish the procedures that we need to for engine number two. Again, we're gonna turn on the air con system. We're going to turn on the hydraulics, engine two, now this time when we turned on the hydraulics, you could see that we have some hydraulic movement here in the gauges. So I'm not sure if maybe we weren't supposed to see anything here or not, but um, I don't know, I'm just letting you guys know. So if we come down here to the main bus and we turn that on, again, 
we have no movement on the gauge whatsoever. Now that the hydraulics are on, we can just turn the air bleed switch off for number two and the cross bleed off for number two as well. At this point, usually Concord would have enough power to, uh, to function on. So we can come down here and turn on the generators on the aircraft. We can hit gen one and two and three and four. At this point, we can also turn on the water heaters as well in the galley. So now that we've got that done, we can also disconnect ground power. Again, we are gonna turn that off right there. So at this point, you would have already gotten everything programmed in your GPS ready to go. Now what we wanna do is start our pushback. Now keep in mind that we don't have all the engines started yet, but let's just take a look at this checklist real quick just to show you another nuance you're gonna run into here. If you were to follow this step by step, okay, so you've started engine number three, you've started engine number two, and now they tell you to turn the EPU switch off. Well, if we come over here and we look on the back here to the EPU switch, if we were to turn this switch off at this point, you will not be able to start the remainder of the engines. So I have no idea why they tell you to do that right now, but do not turn off the EPU switch or your engines will not start. Matter of fact, I'm gonna show you that real quick. So let's turn off the EPU and then we're gonna come over here to the starter on one. We're gonna flip that on. And again, we're gonna come down here and take a look at the N2 gauge for engine number one. Now, I don't know about you, but do you notice something that's not happening here on the gauge? Yep, you've guessed it. The N2 is not rising. So if we head on back here to the engineer station and we go over here to the EPU, we can turn that back on again. And now we head up here, we can now see that the N2 is rising on engine one. Okay, so that shows you another little glitch with the checklist here. So if you're going this step by step, once you turn that EPU off, you won't be able to start any other engines. So we are at 20%. We're going to come up top, turn the fuel on. Now that the N2 is fired up on engine one, we're just going to step back here to the engineer station and we're going to also follow that other procedure. So we're going to turn on the conditioning valve here. We're going to come over and turn on some hydraulics here. And we're going to come down and turn on the main bus for engine number one. As you can see, the gauges did not move at all. And we're going to come back up top side. And we're going to turn off the cross feed and the air bleed. We're going to move on to engine number four. So we're going to come down here and hit the four starter. Move back up front here. And we can watch that until we get up to 20% again on the N2. And we are about there, so we're just going to head back up topside and hit the fuel valve to open that up. I do say, though, I love the Concorde stature. I love that Delta wing. Ah, oh, it's so gorgeous. So pretty. So gorgeous. Mm. All right, so it looks like engine four has come up and just about stabilized. So we're going to head back here to the engineer station again. And we're going to pop up here, turn on the conditioning valve for number four. We're going to head over here and turn on the hydraulic systems for number four as well. And we're going to come down and turn on the bus for number four. And again, we have nothing happening here. At this point, you can come down and turn off the EPU and close the cover. Now we're going to come back up top side. We are going to turn off the cross bleed and turn on the turn off the air bleed. So that pretty much takes care of the starting procedure for the Concorde, at least in the Microsoft Flight Sim version. Okay, so now we're going to head back to the front and start following the remainder of the checklist. So we're going to make sure that the flight controls are full and free. Keep in mind, if you want to turn on and off the yoke, you can right there. So we can see that they're good. The auto flight controls and the trims, I believe that's automatic flight control systems. 
and the trims, you want to make sure those are set. So that is going to be up here on the autopilot settings. So we're able to come in here and set a throttle. Now if you click on the center of this knob, you can now adjust in tens instead of and over here on the right hand side this is where we're going to set our altimeter again if you click on the center of that we can adjust everything by hundreds click on it again by tens click on it again and you're in the thousands so I think that might be a little weird uh, I don't know why we would need to set it by the tens um, I don't know give me your thoughts on that so the next other little weird thing that I saw here that we can control our heading right here so if we look down here we can see the compass and the OBS this is where we would set our course and everything so you can see that the heading is moving when I change the heading up in the autopilot and also we can change the heading here as well if you press on the center of the knob it's going to center that heading for us to adjust the course you can turn this knob here and it will adjust the course for us to get your course knob to function you need to come up here to the little rad and INS switch and flip that over to rad and when you do flip it over to rad you now have the ability to change your course and you also have that course up here on your autopilot as well if you click on that it will center the course as well down here this will also center the course for you and make it a little bit easier now here's the little tricky thing if you highlight over the uh, heading knob here and click on it you have an up arrow and a down arrow if you click the up arrow did you see what just happened on this display everything got reversed now if you click down on it it changes it again some people may now start to get confused of which direction they have this pointing I don't understand why they would want to do that unless you were doing some sort of back course type deal um, and that may be a little bit more advanced than I'm aware of for VOR flying but here's gonna be a great way to figure out if you have this oriented in the right direction so if we synchronize this with our current heading you can see it's synced and it is behind us so that tells us that this is backwards so all you need to do is click either up or down to get it to show properly so that's just a good way to figure out if this gauge is in the proper orientation for you or not just something else I ran into and when you do flip this back to the INS that means it's going to be following your GPS um, and any course that you have plotted in your FMS unit or INS whatever you want to call it okay perfect so let's head up back to the checklist again and continue moving on so the stability and feel switches we need to make sure those are all on as well so the stability switches and feel those are all going to be right here so you're going to want to turn on every man that gets annoying but I just want this to be there so everybody can see what these switches are so if you do not have the Concorde or are thinking about purchasing it it may help you out a little bit but boy is it irritating because you can't click the darn switches properly okay so now we've got all the circuit breakers on we are now going to go up to the engine anti-ice if you did need anti-ice you can switch all the anti-ice switches on we're not going to use that today hydraulics you want to make sure that those are within limits it does look like everything is functioning I'm not sure if the actual level of the hydraulic fluid changes um, that might be something that they'll add in the future but I'm not sure in any case I think all of these are gonna stay about the same I don't think they really change so now that we have got and checked the hydraulics let's move on to the taxi procedure so during this checklist we are gonna have a couple other nuances that we're gonna have to deal with here so let's get into those right now the CG movement as required so what they're telling us to do is um, they want you to get your center of gravity trimmed properly but the problem is here they don't actually tell you where it should be trimmed it just says CG movement as required now they should tell us on takeoff 
the center of gravity should be forward or should be aft. And if we take a look over here on the panel here, we can see that the center of gravity is all shifted towards the back of the aircraft. So I'm not sure if that's correct or not for takeoff, and it doesn't say anything here for the checklist. So if you know a little bit about the Concorde, let me know down in the comments of where the fuel should be trimmed for takeoff, whether it should be trimmed forward or aft. So I see here that on takeoff, once you get over your 400 knots or so, it's telling us to trim the fuel aft. So it's real weird because it doesn't, it's not specific enough. Now I know on descent down into your landing, they want you to trim all the fuel forward. Looks like that's one of the problems with this that um, as you can see, we put this into forward transfer and all the fuel should be getting switched forward for us. But unfortunately, it is not moving any of the fuel forward for our center of gravity. So one of the things that I do want to get into, if you're having this issue, um, remember we had talked about before a little earlier that everything in the center here is what's going to shift on us. So this is how we're going to be able to move around fuel. So let's go ahead and trim the fuel forward. So there's a couple things that we need to make sure that's done for this to happen properly. So we need to come down here and the inlet valves, we need to turn those into the auto position. And remember, we are gonna be trimming fuel from this back tank to this front tank. Remember, everything in here is gonna be our trim. We're now gonna come up to the front tanks and turn these inlet valves to auto. The other thing that we wanna make sure that is done, we need to pump the fuel from the rear tanks forward. So these switches need to make sure that they are on and most likely it's just gonna revert them to the on position anyway. Now, if we take a look at the center of gravity here, it is still not changed at all. We have no change in the CG for the aircraft. So what we need to do is to come back up topside and we're going to manually open the fuel valves. When we manually open those fuel valves, you can now see that the CG is switching forward. Again, I'm not sure if it's correct to transfer all the fuel forward for takeoff, but on landing, they want all the fuel forward. In the documentation, it does tell you that you may have to increase or decrease the limit so you're gonna set the amount of fuel that you want to shift forward here and same thing up here you have a selector so that you can set the amount of fuel you want to shift backwards I'm not sure if these work exactly correctly or not I don't know so let's try that out real quick before we get up in the air and let's just see if this is gonna work so we set this for 2,000 kilograms of fuel that we're gonna shift to the back of the plane now. And let's take a look at these gauges and see if they are going to move with uh, the fuel. All right, so let's go ahead and come down here and we're gonna flip the fuel to the back. And as you see, all these switches lit up. And now let's take a look at the center of gravity. So as you can see here, it doesn't look like the center of gravity is shifting at all. We have no movement uh, whatsoever on the fuel inside the front tank to the rear tank. So again, what we need to do is to come down here and to open both inlet valves for the rear tank. As soon as we do that, you can see that we are now getting fuel shifting. But what I want to do is I want to see if these gauges are going to move and stop at 2,000 kilos of fuel. So let's see what happens here. So again, when we flip this to the back, you saw all the pumps. So it activates all the pump switches correctly, but unfortunately, it's not activating the inlet valves correctly. So the tank that you're going to be transferring to you need to make sure that you open up the inlet valves to those tanks. 
So it looks like here that I set 2,000 kilograms of fuel to be transferred, but it really looks like it's transferring more than 2,000 kilograms because this tank was on 8,000 and now we're on 6. And this one was a little over 6, I believe. And see, it's still transferring fuel back. Okay, so at least you know that now, that in the documentation, it's actually going to tell you that you need to set these to 8,000 kilograms. It wants you to transfer from one tank to another. But unfortunately, when you use this selector to transfer the amount of fuel that you want, it is not going to do so. I think I just proved that by us setting this to 2,000 and it transferred way over 2,000 kilograms of fuel. So before we move on with the checklist, there is a couple other things that we need to turn on here that, again, it really didn't tell us to do. So the equipment bay cooling, we need to turn those on as well, and the standby. So now that those are on, we can finish up with the taxi checklist, so let's just go ahead and finish here. So we need to make sure our, our engine rating is in climb. Those are actually going to be right up top here, and it's all for these switches. You want to make sure that they are in the climb position. Next, we need to make sure that the auto ignitions are in the on position. So the auto ignitions are all right here. So we're going to go ahead and flip those up in the on position. Again, it doesn't have an on off, so you're not sure of if you're putting them in the correct direction. Next, we need to make sure that all the air intakes are set. So the air intake system is gonna be right here to the left of your engineer station. Now, this is all gonna be automatic. You can move these manually if you want, but you have to come up here and flip this to the manual position, and then you can come down here and activate the ramps for the engines. In my opinion, just leave it up to the automatic and it will go for you. Oh, and while we're over here, all of your lighting for the engineer station is going to be right here to the left of the engineer. So now that we have checked that, we want to make sure that the engine control schedule is checked. Here's another little quirk with the Concorde. For takeoff, you want to turn this into flyover mode and they don't really tell you in the checklist here they don't even tell you what to turn it to it just says checked but it doesn't tell you where to turn it all right so next we're going to go to the engine 4 takeoff n1 limiter to 88 percent again i think this is going to be another one that's going to throw some people off because if we hit the little eyeball button well it actually highlights engine 2 3 fuel idle switch and that's not the correct switch for this i asked dc designs about this as well and they said to their knowledge this is all correct but you can plainly see that if we highlight this it says engine four takeoff and one limiter switch that's the limiter switch that you want to turn to 88 percent so don't let that fool you in the checklist because that's just one other thing that uh, is a little off. All right, next we're gonna make sure that all the feed pumps are on. We've already done that, so we know they're on anti-skid, trim tanks checked, de-air pumps on. So there's a de-air pump here in the back, and then there's also a de-air pump on the front. But depending on which tank you are shifting, so because we're moving fuel from the back tank to the front tank, it does not allow you to de-air the front tank, only the back tank. All right, CG position as expected. Again, they don't actually tell us what the CG should be, so it's really hard to say if we've got it in the right position. So if you want to manually turn the pumps on and off, all you need to do is just keep this on the off position, and then you'll be able to manually come down and turn on and off all of our pumps. So I think that's probably gonna be your best bet um, for shifting fuel around in this aircraft, at least in this version, because using this forward and back button doesn't work for me. Maybe it does work for you, and maybe I'm not doing something correctly, but post it down below in the comments and uh, let me know. Again, now we can turn the D-Air pump on for the front tank as well. 
so we will make sure that that's done autopilot is already set up and now we're going to move on to the takeoff so according to the takeoff checklist uh, of course we want to make sure that the we're going to turn on some lights here and look the beacon light turned off we didn't turn that beacon light off it went off on itself so we're just going to turn on some lights here and again i'm not following any procedures i'm just trying to show everybody all the little nuances that you may encounter with the new dc designs concord all right so they're asking us to engage the reheat buttons so those reheat buttons are down here and again remember they really don't do anything for us at all because as soon as you give full throttle it's going to automatically activate the reheat which i think is a little crazy so on takeoff we're going to start rotating at 170 knots now the other thing that it tells doesn't really explain to us is for trim on this aircraft it doesn't really say where the trim should be on the aircraft in my opinion i think it would need to be a little bit in the up position but i'm not really sure so if somebody knows where the trim should be set please also let me know down in the comments section and uh, this way i can let all the viewers know for the trim because unfortunately in the manual they give us for it does not give us any information for the trim hey and by the way if you're enjoying the content today make sure to go down below and hit the subscribe button and tick that little bell so you don't miss any of our future episodes so the other thing that uh, we can do while we are taxiing down to the runway is turn on some landing lights now unfortunately you can't click on both switches you can only click on one and I think it's opposite on this side so as you see you can only click on the one now taxi lights again same thing you can only click on one but when it comes to the turn lights they are individually operated just something else to be aware of also if you did want to test out the uh, if you did want to test out all these uh, warning lights you are not able to do that either oh uh, the other thing is we have the pedos up here and I don't know if you just saw that. Look at that. I cannot turn the pedo heat off manually. It's going to constantly keep turning it back on. So I just think that there's some little things. It just, honestly, this edition of the Concord makes me feel like this is more of a beta version because it, it's it's not um, it's not polished. All right, so let's turn around down here and. Um, Let's get this thing off the ground and show you what happens. Now, keep in mind that once we go to take off with Concorde, we're going to be pulling back about 12, 13 degrees until we come off the ground. And then we're going to gradually increase that to 20 degrees all the way up until we get to 250 knots. And then we are going to disengage the reheat. So let's go ahead and uh, do our call. Everything is checked. We are ready to go. Three, two, one, now. I think we're getting close to 170. So I'm gonna all the way back on the stick. And if you can see, we're at 200. 220 and we're just now coming off the ground and afterburners are off and pretty much they say that we're going to maintain our pitch of the aircraft uh, maintaining 250 knots so if you get a little faster you can pull back on the aircraft and that's going to pitch up And as you can see, I'm pitching up quite a bit to keep the uh, aircraft at 250 knots. I'm right about at 30 degrees now to keep the aircraft right. So now that we are up, we're going to get the autopilot to help us out a little bit. We're going to arm the auto throttles. Uh, we're going to turn on IAS hold. We are also going to tur turn on heading hold. And we're going to hit the autopilot. And that should now maintain our heading. We're going to come over here and hit altitude hold 
and we are now going to increase our altitude to about 45,000. We're going to hit the autopilot altitude acquire button and that should now start pitching us up. It takes a little bit for this to happen. But as you can see, Concorde is now starting to pitch upward. And we are now going to go into max climb mode. So max climb mode is going to set us to about 400 knots. So as you can see, we are now starting to climb in the aircraft. Again, I'm not sure if this is all 100% correct or not, but I can just show you what we are getting here in Concorde. So let's go outside and you can see what's going to happen here. All right, so after we've engaged the max climb, it's now telling us that we need to engine rating, we need to turn into cruise. So we're gonna head back up topside and we are now going to switch all of these into cruise. We're gonna make sure that the secondary air doors are either in the open or auto, and they are already in the auto position. The visor, we are now going to put up and lock it and it looks like we should have did that at 4,000 feet. So we're just going to use our flap handle and put up the visor. Okay. All right, now we're gonna set the fuel transfer to aft because we need to get the center of gravity moving backwards as you can see here. Uh, and that's is really crucial for Concorde supersonic flight. Uh, that's how it helps to reduce drag. So we're going to switch fuel from the forward tanks to the rear tanks. And again, to do that, we're going to switch our pumps in the on position in the forward tank. So we're just gonna come to the aft tanks and open both of the rear inlet valves to the tanks. And we should now start to see the center of gravity start to shift towards the back of the aircraft. And there you go. So as that shifts, um, it will put us in a better flying position. We can also go over here and turn all of these onto auto as well for our other tanks. So at this point, because we're not able to set a fuel selector quantity, because we're not able to select a fuel quantity to be transferred into the tanks, you have to manually monitor this so that uh, you don't put too much fuel towards the back. But again, you really have to make sure that you've got enough fuel in these stability tanks to be able to do this properly. And, and of course, I think you probably wanted to do this way, way lower in your ascent up to your 50,000 feet or so. So uh, this way you have the time and it has the time to do that. So the engine control schedule, uh, we are now going to turn that to normal flight and that is this knob right here. So if you remember when we initially did our checklist here, they didn't tell us what to put it on, um, but it should be on flyover. At this point, we can now turn that on normal. We're gonna seek 15,000 feet. We're way over that and uh, we are good to go. Fuel transfer, this tells you how to do a fuel transfer. All right, so the air intakes, they want you to check those, but they don't actually tell you how to check them. Again, we've got it in auto, so we don't really have to worry about it, but it does tell us that we want the center of gravity at 58%. So that is really cool. At least it lets us know of where we need to have that so CG. Reheat, it's telling us to turn the reheat off once we reach Mach 1.7. We are just about at Mach 1.7 and it has now automatically turned off the reheat. So that is nice to see that it, uh, it did what it was supposed to do for once, hey! All right, so let's hop back in the uh, aircraft. We can check fuel pressure, which doesn't really give us anything. CG movement, we're still moving, and the de-air pumps, we're gonna turn those off at this point. So right down there and the one up there, we can turn those off. Now here's where it says to set 8,000 kilogram transfer, but as 
you saw, that really doesn't work at all. And we're now going to work our way up to 50,000 feet. So let's come over here to the autopilot and set us up for 50,000 feet here. Now, if you have acquired your altitude already, so we are at our 45,000 where we were, if we want to increase, all you need to do is hit the autopilot altitude acquired and it will then continue climbing. Once it gets to that climb altitude, the altitude hold should activate for you. So once you get to Mach 1.7, because through 1.5 is very difficult to get moving, but once we get through 1.7, you no longer need your reheat anymore. So to turn the reheat off, you're gonna have to turn off the max climb to deactivate the reheat and turn off your auto throttle because otherwise it's going to try to maintain 400 knots and that's not what you want either. So um, once you turn off your auto throttle, all you gotta do is just pull back on the throttles a little bit and it will deactivate the reheat for you. And the uh, aircraft should continue climbing all the way up until our 50,000 feet, which we are there right now. So at this point, the aircraft is going to continually um, start to increase speed as we burn fuel up to Mach 2. So now let's go to the cruise portion and now we're going to want to turn the engine rating into cruise and I think it already told us to do that before. Yeah, engine rating mode to cruise. Here we go. So here's another little problem with the checkoff or the, the checklist here. So it's telling us to turn the engine rating to cruise, and this is on the takeoff checklist. Why would you do that on takeoff? So because we've already done that, they're already in cruise, but we do need to come down here to the engine rating here and turn this into flight mode now. I don't really think it's gonna do anything for us, but we just need to do that, and then we can engage max cruise, and then we're gonna seek Mach 2 can come over here and we're just going to hit max cruise. We can turn on the auto throttle again and now it is going to maintain max cruise for us. As you can see our CG down here is starting to finally come down to where it needs to and if we monitor it over here on the engineer's pod we can see that the CG is still shifting towards the rear of the aircraft. At this point, when we go to activate the max cruise, you want to make sure that you have the auto throttle engaged for it to control your throttle for us. So how Concorde usually would operate is they would get up to about that 50,000 feet, and then as the fuel starts burning off, the plane would then cruise higher and higher and higher, all the way up to about 60,000 feet. So I'm not sure of how that is supposed to function here in Concorde um, because when I hit the 60,000 feet and hit the altitude required and Mach holds, so that's going to hold us at Mach 2, um, I guess it's going to ascend us all the way up to 60,000 feet maintaining Mach 2. But yeah, I think that the engines may be a little overpowered here for the Concorde version in Microsoft Flight Sim. Um, only because uh, we're almost at 60,000 feet and we're still at Mach 2. So, um, that's pretty crazy. Alright, so as you can see, the fuel is now being trimmed pretty well. Uh, we are now trimmed down just about where we need to. So at this point, um, as you can see, our front tanks don't have much left in them at, at this point. And, and that's why it's really, really crucial that you have and make sure that you've got enough fuel in your stabilizer tanks so that you're able to shift around some fuel. Now keep in mind that if you top these tanks off completely, so if I were to take this and top it off completely and this one completely, then that does not leave you any room to shift some stuff around. So it looks like you have two forward transfer tanks, which are right here, two forward, and I guess that explains it here. So we have two tanks 
on the forward side and on the rear we have one trim tank on the rear and if we go down here yes we just have one gauge on the rear for a rear trim tank so yeah make sure that you have at least one of these forward tanks completely full um, so that you can move some fuel around but don't fill both of them up because then you won't be able to transfer any fuel forward again you probably don't have to transfer any fuel forward during takeoff because you're going to be transferring everything to the back of the airplane anyway so at this point because our center of gravity is right around where we need it to be um, we're just going to go ahead and turn off all of our pumps to the tanks right now and um, because we no longer need to transfer anything so we're just going to flip these back down into auto and we're going to turn off the forward pumps that are pumping everything backwards and we are all set to go at this point so now we are in supersonic flight and let's take a look at this from the outside I must say flying at 60,000 feet really is cool and the other thing is when you get around to the front of this aircraft because we are going supersonic um, we do not have any noise so we are completely silent around the front of the aircraft but my isn't she beautiful got some gorgeous contrails coming out of the backside man so after i've explained all of these little nuances to you and i haven't even gotten to the ins system on this aircraft yet what are your thoughts are you gonna buy it did you buy it how do you feel about your purchase leave it down below in the comments section i would love to hear everybody's input on this fantastic aircraft yes i think there are some things that could be changed and that may be coming down the line but if you have any questions or concerns please post those down below in the comments section and if you haven't done so already while you're down there make sure you hit that subscribe button tick that little bell and smash on that thumbs up button Thanks everybody for joining us here today on the channel and to all of my flight simmer friends around the world. Keep the blue side up and we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching everybody.